This is the third and final video in Module 1, DNA Discovery and Structure. In this video, I'll be discussing the different ways that DNA is packaged, depending on whether or not the cell contains a nucleus. Large amounts of DNA are packaged into a single cell, which requires some type of folding to occur. DNA is really big. There's thousands upon millions of nucleotides all all lined up in either a single circular chromosome if you're a bacteria or multiple linear chromosomes if you are a eukaryote. All of this is a large amount of material and it is only allowed to occupy a very small amount of the cell volume. And so this means DNA has to be condensed down into a smaller form in order to fit inside the cell. It also needs to be condensed down into an even smaller form right before cellular division. So to make sure that each cell contains um, the appropriate amount of chromosomes. Let's first talk about how this is done in a prokaryote or a cell that does not contain a nucleus because it's way easier and less complex. When I'm talking about a prokaryote without a nucleus, I'm mostly talking about bacteria. Bacterial DNA is super coiled, which means that it's um, twisted and twisted and twisted until it collapses on itself. And so what this image is showing you here is an E. coli cell that has been very gently heated so that the cell remains intact, but its contents have started to spill out. Um, the contents that you see here is the genome. Look at how big the genome is. This is one long circular genome that, it, that, you're, that you're viewing under the scope right now. This is an electron microscope. All of that material has to fit into one very small portion of the cell. DNA do this by overwinding or underwinding its circular chromosome. This is only possible because it is a circular chromosome. So what happens is an enzyme called topoisomerase makes a, a tiny little cut in the DNA and then proceeds to twist it and twist it and twist it and turn it on itself. Because it's a circle and it doesn't unwind on the other end, it just keeps overwinding or underwinding to create what's called a supercoil. And then when the enzyme lets go, the genome um, collapses onto itself into this coiled up form here. And so it's not in its relaxed state um, when it's packaged up, it's in this much more condensed state. If you have something at home, like a telephone cord or some type of circular piece of thread that is double stranded, so it has to have two two um, pieces of thread. You can try this experiment at home where you can twist one end um, and then wait to see what happens. You can also do this with long hair. So you can take a long piece of hair and, tur and turn it and just keep twisting it and then move the hair closer to your head and note that it sort of tumbles up on itself or collapses on itself. This is how bacteria do it. It's very simple. But the, reason, the only reason that is possible is because bacterial chromosomes are circular and there's usually only one of them. This is not possible for um, eukaryotes, which have multiple linear chromosomes that have to be packaged within a nucleus. For eukaryotes, DNA has to be associated with proteins in order to condense it down small enough to what we call a chromosome. Okay, so First, let's talk about what this picture is showing you. This is a chromosome, right? This is always what we think about when we think about our genomes, these little X's that live in our cells. But what's funny is that they only look like this right before the cell is about to divide. So right before the cell is about to divide, DNA is compacted into its highest order, its most compact form called a chromosome. Um, and I'm gonna show you how we get there. When DNA is being expressed or when a gene is turned on, it doesn't look at all like this. It's much less condensed and less associated with proteins so that the enzymes responsible for either replicating it or expressing it can access the DNA. When DNA is wrapped around a protein, it is not as accessible and so the enzymes can't bind to it. Um, okay, and so this means DNA is constantly cycling between condensed form and a less condensed form, a more condensed form and a less condensed form, depending on whether or not the cell is actively dividing or genes are actively being expressed. DNA associated with proteins is collectively called chromatin. So anytime a DNA is linked to a protein, we call it chromatin, all of it. Um, there are two types of chromatin. There's euchromatin, and heterochromatin, and I've colored them here to match 
their locations on the chromosome in this picture. Euchromatin, or the yellow material, is less condensed DNA, so it's not as tightly associated with proteins, so the enzymes that need to turn that DNA into RNA or replicate that DNA can actually access the DNA itself. It's not as wrapped around proteins. So we tend to see this on the chromosome's arms here in yellow. These types of sequences tend to be unique, and so there are protein coding sequences, um, unique combinations of nucleotides that make unique proteins. There are many, many genes found on this in, in euchromatin, unless what we call, or what some people call junk DNA, or DNA that doesn't encode a protein. So most protein coding genes are found within the euchromatin areas of the chromosome. Um, uh, euchromatin is replicated throughout S phase, um, which isn't totally interesting, actually, so you can probably just like ignore this part, um, but it is transcribed often, so it is active DNA. This is where there's protein coding genes, and so this DNA is often being used and transcribed into RNA. Heterochromatin, which is in pink here, so this is the ends in the very center of the chromosome, is far more condensed. In fact, it's very unlikely to be completely decondensed. So we only see this at the centromeres or at the telomeres. And heterochromatin is more of a structural type of DNA as opposed to a functioning type of DNA. Um, the centromeres and the telomeres are really important for different reasons that I'll describe on other slides. The types of sequences you tend to find here are repetitive DNA, so AT, 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 over and over and over, or CAG, 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 over and over and over, repeat DNA. There's very few protein coding genes within these regions, um, and therefore it is very infrequently turned into RNA, if at all. So how do we get a chromosome in the first place? First, we start with a DNA double helix. This would be the least condensed form. Then we create what's called a nucleosome, which is DNA wrapped about one and a half times around eight core histone proteins. So it's sort of think of the histone proteins as a spool and the DNA as the thread wrapped around that spool. We call DNA, one and a half turns of DNA wrapped around eight histone proteins, a nucleosome. That's the next form of con condensing. Nucleosomes can then fold on themselves to, call, to form nucleosome fibers. Those fibers will then continue to fold upon themselves, creating more and more condensed DNA until we end up with what's called a chromatid, which is one half of that X chromosome that you sort, sort, of, sort of think about the X form. There are two chromatids called sister chromatids per chromosome, but again, Sister chromatids only form right before a cell is about to replicate. Keep that in mind as we move forward because we're going to come back to this concept in the second module. So let's look at what I just showed you on this slide, only in a picture form. So here we start with the DNA double helix at its simplest level. It's not actually even chromatin yet because it's not associated with any proteins. Once we start to complex DNA to a protein, now we finally have the first level of chromatin. This is a nucleosome or eight histone proteins with one and a half turns of DNA wrapped around it. And this is another protein sort of linking them together. So this is the nucleosome. Now we start to condense those nucleosomes all together. So nucleosomes will start to um, fold up on itself. Where is that? Oh, here. So nucleosomes will fold up to produce a fiber that's about 30 nanometers wide. So they just sort of crunch and condense upon themselves. Those fibers are then folded and looped to create 250 nanometer wide fibers. So here's our loops of these fibers here. And then those loops condense even more on themselves, fold and turn on themselves until we eventually get tight coiling and an official chromosome. So let's talk about, let's come back to this idea of heterochromatin, which is condensed DNA that never really fully decondenses. It is almost always associated with a protein in some way. Let's first talk about the centromere. Centromeres are the very center of a chromosome where the two sister chromatids are joined together. Centromeres form right before a cell is about to replicate. 
This is a really important structural component of the chromosome since the centromere is where spindle fibers will attach during mitosis um, when a cell is dividing. And so here we see an example of a chromosome, two sister chromatids in one single centromere. Unfortunately, two arms of the chromosome have broken off and they themselves no longer have a centromere associated with them. During anaphase of mitosis, spindle fibers will attach to the centromeres of this chromosome and pull apart these two sister chromatids, making sure that one gets to one side and the other gets to the other side. And this also ensures that both cells have equal amounts of genetic material. Remember, um, genes must replicate faithfully, and we need to make sure that both of these cells contain equal amounts of genetic material. Unfortunately, these small pieces that broke off no longer have centromeres associated with them. So there's no place for the spindle fibers to attach and they sort of float around. When the nuclear membrane starts to reform around the genome, these pieces are left out because there's no centromere there. They weren't pulled apart appropriately. And so those will degrade and those fragments are then lost forever. And so a centromere is really important for making sure that each daughter cell after a division gets equal amounts of DNA. Telomeres have another really important um, structural uh, function. So the structural, or so the function of a telomere is to form a protective cap that presents the chromosome, a linear chromosome from degrading. Circular chromosomes don't have ends, and so they are very faithfully replicated every single time the cell divides. However, in a linear chromosome, they do have ends, they have two ends, and unfortunately, there's no way to completely close the gap on the end when replicating a DNA, a DNA molecule. If you're really interested in this concept, I'll post a video for you to watch about the end replication problem, but I described the end replication problem in another course, Bio 260 and Molecular Biology. We're not going to really worry too much about that in this course, but it is interesting, and so I will post that video for those of you who are curious. Every single time a linear genome replicates, we are left with a gap at the end. This is single-stranded DNA and is recognized as something that is dangerous or foreign. Single-stranded DNA is a signature of viruses, and so our bodies have enzymes that degrade single-stranded DNA to protect us from single-stranded DNA viruses. This means that every time a genome replicates, you're gonna lose some genetic material at the end as an enzyme will come and chop up that little bit. So your chromosomes shorten every single time your cell degrade or a cell replicates. Fortunately, our chromosomes come preloaded with this sort of repetitive caps on the end of all of our chromosomes. And so that we're not really losing any important protein coding genes every time our genome shortens. We're losing just this repetitive AGG, TT, AGG, TT, all of that stuff. It doesn't code for anything, so it's okay to lose a little bit of it. And so that's the function of a telomere. Its function is to get degraded basically every single time the cell divides, but it protects the protein coding regions in the center from being degraded and it protects you from losing important information. What's really interesting is that we scientists have started to look at telomere length as telltale signs of particular social components or aging components. And so one thing that Kenan et al. looked at in 2011 was shortened telomeres as an effect of adverse childhood events. And so they looked at different groups of children that had experienced different adverse life events. Um, and so when they look at individual children who have no adverse life events in their early childhood, so this was 387 children who experienced no adverse life events, they had relatively long telomeres compared to a control. So this is a control telomere length, and this is their telomere length. So basically no childhood events, they have fairly normal telomeres. One adverse childhood event, again, not really gonna change your telomere length, but when you start to increase that to two, three, or four to nine adverse childhood events in early childhood, their telomeres have, are shorter compared to the control. And so what this means is extreme stress in early childhood can shorten your telomeres prematurely. Who cares, right? Who cares if your telomeres are short? They're full of junk anyway. It's just repetitive DNA. Well, not necessarily the case. 
Other scientists have shown that telomere length is correlated with your lifespan. And so in 2003, Cawthorn et al. showed that telomere length declines in your dividing cells as you age. They looked at leukocytes or white blood cells and found that every single time the cells divided, the genome got shorter in length. We kind of predicted this because we know that linear chromosomes are difficult to replicate. So when a child is born, their telomere length is about 8,000 base pairs. A 35-year-old adult has a telomere length that's only 3,000 base pairs, and a 65-year-old adult has a telomere length that's only 1,500 base pairs, implying that as we age, our telomeres are getting shorter and shorter, and that eventually you're going to run out of telomere cap and you're going to start to experience de or, um, cells that are not stable, right? Cells that are unable to replicate or um, cells that are unable to express the proteins they need. And so it was thought that telomere length is correlated with your lifespan. In 2019, there was a study that showed that it's not necessarily the length of your telomeres that predicts your lifespan, but the rate of their shortening. So how quickly they tend to short, uh, shorten. And so this group looked at different species of animals. So we looked at humans, they looked at elephants, flamingos, dolphins, all the way down to mouse and measured how short how short their telomeres get each year. So our telomeres lose about 70 base pairs per year. Compare that to a mouse, which loses about 7,000 base pairs per year and also represents the organism with the shortest lifespan. And so it might not necessarily be that, you know, people who experience adverse life events as children might live shorter lives, but just that in general, our lives tend to be longer than other organisms because we don't lose as much of our telomere each year. Um, there's lots of, still lots and lots of exploration about this idea of aging linked to telomere length. So I, I um, invite you to explore the literature on this. It's fascinating and it changes each year.